bentar ik. ini lagi minta apa security code-nya Uh, the stream is started at idea ya. The stream is started at ideas YouTube channel. Um, oh. atau dimulai aja kan udah di idea udah muncul kan? nggak apa-apa di prodem soalnya ini agak lama sih kalau ini oke okay. ya yeah. so oke okay. oke okay, husbu we can start now thank you uh, warm greetings everyone uh, depending on recording uh, in progress where you are tuning in from good morning Good afternoon and good evening to all. I am Kushpu Agrawal and I'm your host and moderator for today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the International Conference on Reforming Political Party Finance in Southeast Asia towards greater transparency and accountability, organized jointly by Preludium and International Idea with support from the USAID to commemorate the International Democracy Day celebrated annually on 15 September. The topic for today couldn't be more relevant as political finance is one of the most crucial issues of our times when it comes to the quality of democracy. Today's event is the first in the series of conferences being organized on the issue of political party finance in Southeast Asia to be held between the months of September and October. These series of conferences are being organized primarily to disseminate the results of research led by Preludium under the RESPECT project on political party finance reform in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Timor-Leste, as well as to identify and analyze the challenges and opportunities related to political party finance reforms in Southeast Asian countries. To kickstart the conference, I would like to invite Ms. Khoirunista Nur Agustiati, the Executive Director of Preludem, to provide her opening remarks. Ms. Agustiati, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kusmu. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this virtual conference of reforming political finance system in Southeast Asia uh, towards greater transparency and accountability. This conference is part of International Day commemoration that we celebrate every year at September 15th. This is a series of international conference of political party finance reform agenda in Southeast Asia that supported by USAID under the RESPECT program or Asia Pacific Regional Support for Election and Political Transition Program. One of the activities of RESPECT program is doing research about political finance reform. This is a joint research that conducted by not only Perludem, but also Perludem's partner, Lente from Philippines, Mercy 2.0 from Malaysia, Uh, Pradet and Kokus from Timor Leste, and not only that, uh, we have also collaboration with the, the international idea to give the international perspective uh, for this research. So everyone, you can see on your screen, uh, this is the cover of the book. This is the result of the research. Uh, this uh, research is con uh, consists of five, pa five parts. The first is about comparative overview of political finance system in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Timor Leste the regional context and the way forward. Uh, it is written by the international idea. And then uh, the second part is political party finance in Indonesia, a never ending reform. The third is political party financing in Malaysia. The fourth is political party finance in the Philippines. And the fifth gift is the political party finance reform in Timor-Leste. You can all download uh, this research in our website, www.peludem.org. And we will also share the link on the chat box so you can uh, download uh, the, this research. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we talk about political party finance in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Timor-Leste, we can see that there is more or less, uh, we are in the same condition. There is still lack of comprehensive regulations, not only for the limitation of, donating, uh, of donation or spending, but also the reporting and audit process of political finance. Uh, to disseminate this research, we, as well as to discuss the agenda to political party finance reform in Southeast Asia, we held a series of international conference. This is also collaboration with the international idea, Lente, Bersih 2.0, uh, Pradet and Koku. So this is not only the conference that we held, but we, we still have uh, three other conferences 
tomorrow we will have conference uh, that held by our friends from the Philippines, Lente. So don't forget to join tomorrow's conference. I would like to send my gratitude to all writers and all speakers for this conference. Mr. Yukihiko, Mr. Andreas Ufan, uh, Ms. Rumbizai, uh, Ms. Desi Simanjuntak, and also, of course, our moderator, uh, Ms. Kusbu Agrawai. Thank you so much for making the time for this conference and have a great discussion. Back to you, Kusbu. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Agustiati, um, for this very comprehensive and succinct uh, introduction. Uh, I would now like to invite Ms. Lina Rikila Tamang, Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific at International IDEA, to share her remarks. Lina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Kospu, and uh, welcome. And thank you, everyone, um, for attending this conference on reforming political finance systems in Southeast Asia. As mentioned, um, uh, the conference is all organized also to commemorate the International Day of Democracy, on which takes place on 15th September. And while the moment, it is the work of Peludem uh, and other civil society organizations that gives us uh, glimmers of hope and um, and like the research that we are today. And I would like to recognize and this report that we are to, are to publish. I think it's the report that is first of its kind, uh, taking a comparative look at systems in Southeast Asia, civil society organizations and uh, experts. And I'm also grateful uh, for Peludem and the Respect Project for um, involving international idea and hence recognizing also our long-term comments. And uh, here, let me also take an uh, opportunity to thank uh, the Manian Politics team in uh, in the, at IDEA Stockholm for their support and collaboration, and they were also contributing in today's conference panel. International IDEA is in the governmental organization, including Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, as member states from Southeast Asia. And our mandate is to support democracy worldwide, and money and politics and political finance is one of our priority areas of work. This cross-country study that we have at hand uh, related to dangers of use of money, I think it sends us a warning sign. Uh, we must all be very alert, the potential state of state capture, to illicit use of money in politics. But this report also sends us an encouraging sign uh, by proposing what to do mitigate those adverse effects of non-regulated political finance practices and how to better enforce such regulations where they exist. In June this year, International IDEA launched the Global State of Democracy Indices to be found from IDEA website. And we can see uh, the data shows that corruption continues to quality democracy and in and not much problem of overall corruption. Political transparency, while not a silver bullet, go a long way in curbing political uh, corruption. So therefore, the civil society's efforts in advocating more transparency transparency, more accountability, and more enforceable regulation needs to be supported. And this study is a, is a first step in that direction. And I applaud the USAID as well for, for deciding to support a project like RESPECT. So I look uh, personally look very much forward to this discussion and the panel, and I'm sure this panel will discuss not only the problems, but also propose uh, solutions for, for us to uh, contemplate. So many thanks and uh, back to you, Kushpo. Uh, thank you very much, Lina. We had some technical issue uh, listening to your entire speech, uh, but we did get a gist of uh, what is that. So thank you very much, <laughs> but that's okay. I think the audience uh, 
could find to get the gist of uh, your presentation. So thanks a lot. I just want to remind all our participants that the uh, the report is now available on Preludium's website and our colleague uh, will post the link to the report on the chat box uh, and you can access and read uh, at your leisure. Uh, thank you very much, Lena, once again. Uh, with this, uh, we now move on to our panel for today. Let me quickly run you through some housekeeping rules. Uh, the 90 minute panel will be divided into two sections. During the first 60 to 70 minutes, I will be asking some questions to our panelists. And for the rest 15 to 20 minutes, we will take some questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function if you are joining us via Zoom. If any of our participants want to directly ask a question to our panelists, please use the raise hand function and we will take your question during the Q&A round. If you are watching us on YouTube, either of Preludium or of International IDEA, please feel free to leave your questions in the comment section and we will moderate those questions. Southeast Asia is a diverse region, and this diversity is reflected in the political finance systems in the different countries of the region. There are some similarities, but also differences. One thing that is common among them is none of the system is perfect. There are problems and challenges in every country, whether it relates to the absence of appropriate legislation, loopholes in regulatory frameworks, lack of compliance from political actors, or ineffective implementation. All the 90 minutes is definitely not enough. We will try our best to uncover some of these issues and identify the possible solutions to these problems in the region. And to do so, we are joined by four distinguished panelists today with extensive knowledge and experiences on political party finance systems, both globally and in Southeast Asia. First, we have Ms. Rumbitzai Kandavaspika Nundu, who is the Senior Advisor for Democracy and Inclusion at International IDEA. She is a democracy and gender diversity advocate and practitioner and with several years of engagement on gender equality and women's empowerment in political systems and political parties, electoral systems and processes, constitution building, political financing and parliamentary strengthening all across the globe. Professor Andreas Ufen is an adjunct professor at the University of Hamburg and a senior research fellow at the Giga Institute of Asian Studies in Hamburg. His main interests are democratization, political Islam, political parties, and elections in Southeast Asia. He has published several edited volumes as well as numerous articles in refereed journals. We also with have today Dr. Daisy Siman Chuntak, who is an associate fellow at ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore, as well as a visiting fellow at National Chengchi University in Taipei. Both a political scientist and political anthropologist, she finished her PhD in 2010 from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Her main interests are Southeast Asia's democratic challenges, Indonesia's democracy, decentralization, and identity politics. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Yukihiko Hamada, who is a program manager in the Global Programs Directorate at International IDEA. Dr. Hamada leads the Money in Politics program that supports political finance reforms across the world by providing evidence-based policy analysis and technical assistance to oversight agencies and other stakeholders. His areas of expertise focus on comparative analysis of political finance systems, anti-corruption, and digital solutions to increase political finance transparency. So with this uh, broad, uh, diverse knowledge and experience that we have uh, in the room today, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to have a very, very productive uh, and influential discussion today. And as I said, we will dive directly into the questions uh, and uh, hear from our uh, panelists. So my first question is for you, uh, Yuki. This might sound a very, very simplistic question, but it is a rather important one. Uh, why do you think it is important to regulate the use of money in politics? And could you relate this experience to Southeast Asia? Well, thank you, Kushbe. And yes, indeed, it's, it's a rather simplistic question, but it's a very important one, I would say. And also super fitting uh, and to commemorate International Democracy Day. Um, to start with, um, money in politics or by political finance, we often mean uh, the funding, uh, the regulations relating to the funding of political parties and election campaigns. And then I would, I can't stress this enough that the regulation uh, around political finance is a cornerstone, a uh, milestone to uh, safeguard integrity and um, accountability and transparency of politics in any democracies for a number of reasons. 
to give you a few examples, just a way of introduction to kick off this panel discussion. Um, the first one is, for example, um, unregulated or, or not effectively designed uh, political finance regime um, could easily uh, distort uh, fair uh, and open election among political parties. Uh, just to give you a context that many countries, for example, provide state funding or public funding to political parties, but the criteria for allocation or criteria for eligibility for such funding is not uh, carefully considered. Only the ruling parties or larger parties uh, will benefit from such system and leaving um, the smaller parties or challenger parties uh, in a very disadvantaged position. Well, similarly, um, again, uh, if the money in politics, if the political finance is, is well regulated, is well not well, well regulated, um, this will open the door to um, undue influence or large money to influence the uh, political processes and decision making processes uh, in, in any countries. Um, this could often uh, lead to uh, corruption or corruption risks uh, in many countries. And as um, Lina mentioned, uh, international idea has developed uh, this global indices called global state of democracies. Uh, one of the uh, indicators of this GSOD indices is to measure the absence of corruption in uh, around the world. And interestingly, if you look at this particular uh, uh, com component of GSOD indices, absence of corruption, so to say, um, the perceived level of corruption uh, in the world and, and also in Southeast Asia has not changed significantly in the last 10 years. And of course, there are a number of reasons behind this, um, this static state of uh, absence of corruption, but certainly we believe one of the driving reasons behind it is the uh, slow reform process in political finance or money in politics area. So um, these uh, figures, but also some of the arguments I just mentioned, uh, definitely underscore the need uh, to um, up up again to implement the existing political finance regulations and also think uh, more innovative ways to make money more positive role in politics. Um, yeah, I might just leave it here then, but I'm happy to take questions later. Uh, thank you very much, Yuki. And uh, you set a very uh, good stage for my next question, uh, which was for uh, Daisy. Uh, so Yuki rightly uh, said that regulating uh, the use of money in politics is important to uphold democratic accountability. Uh, what can political finance regimes in Southeast Asia say about the quality of democracy in the region? Daisy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kushbu. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, um, hello to everyone from Taipei. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I, based on my very kind of uh, short um, uh, observation on this in on this uh, subject in Southeast Asia, I by no means uh, am a expert on this. Uh, but I've written uh, some uh, a short article on political financing in several countries in Southeast Asia, namely Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar. Uh, just an overview of what is really happening. So it's not really uh, like a deep analysis into the problems of each country. However, it could all already be discerned that they uh, showed similar, uh, several several similar features, namely uh, the lack of uh, or absence of regulations, uh, the linkages between business businesses and politics. There's also an unlevel playing field for large and small parties. Uh, there's a question of corruption. Uh, and there's uh, different levels of, of course, corruption in different levels of rampancy. And lastly, also a weak monitoring mechanism. So, so if we connect this into to the uh, quality of democracy in Southeast Asia. So in their 2004 article in Journal of Democracy, Larry Diamond and uh, Leonardo Morlino, uh, they wrote that while there's no one single framework for gauging democracy, uh, democratic quality, uh, there are eight dimensions on which uh, democracies vary in quality. So there is the question of freedom, the question of rule of law, vertical accountability, horizontal accountability, responsiveness, equality, participation, competition. So these eight things uh, are, are important when we're, we're, we're trying to see whether there is a, 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 you know, a substantial uh, level of, uh, of you know, quality of democracy in, in, in Southeast Asia. So problems in party and campaign uh, financing that, that uh, I've uh, said before, all these uh, problems, the similar features, 
uh, it can be categorized under challenges in democratic dim dimensions, such as the rule of law, uh, vertical and horizontal accountability. Meanwhile, the unlevel playing field distorts competition. So in my opinion, uh, in, order, um, so in, in order to increase the quality of democracy, in my opinion, uh, pertaining to the political financing aspect, uh, it is useful for um, uh, for countries to increase public financing, basically, uh, of, of, of politics. But not only that, then the most important thing is also to ensure that there is accountability uh, because, you know, I mean, giving, giving parties a lot of money, but not uh, asking them to be responsible for the money and not, not uh, asking them to open their reports to public scrutiny is also uh, not good, yeah? So, so uh, political parties must report their income and expenditures and uh, get audited by uh, public auditors. And these reports have to be uh, open for the public. This hopefully would discourage parties from uh, you know, soliciting illegal donations. And also it, it might help to limit business influence in politics and also improve the openness um, uh, in the internal uh, decision making of the party, so uh, hopefully when that is rich, then there is there, there's more quality in the democracy in Southeast Asia. Uh, thank you, Daisy. And you touched on a very important uh, issue of public funding, but we will get back to the question of public funding at the later mm -hmm. stage. But right now, I want to uh, pose a question to Andreas. Uh, both Yuki and uh, Daisy uh, emphasized uh, the, the the role that political finance can uh, play in combating corruption. And you have written a lot about interlinkages between political finance and corruption in Southeast Asia. So my question to you is, uh, what are some of the factors relating to political finance that has had implications on corruption in the region? Yeah, well, I think political finance and corruption are linked in many different ways. It depends, for example, on regime type, on the form of political competition between candidates and between political parties, and the link between private and state-owned companies and politics in general. For example, in closed authoritarian systems, there's often no real need to spend much money. There's almost no competition, such as in Vietnam, for example, or also in, in Indonesia under Suharto until 1998. In Singapore, you have, uh, I would say, an electoral authoritarian system, but very much dominated by the People's Action Party, a very strong party. Opposition parties in Singapore are weak. And in combination with a system of very strict political finance regulations, money politics is not really an issue in, in Singapore. The problem begins with, uh, you could call them hybrid regimes in between closed authoritarianism and liberal democracy that is competitive authoritarian systems, electoral democracies. In these systems, you have incentives uh, for entrepreneurs to invest money in politics. The electoral contestation is very strong. And at the same time, uh, democratic institutions, oversight agencies, for example, or courts uh, are quite weak. If you look um, uh, in Malaysia, for example, until at least 2018, there was a very strong link between the dominant party, AMNO and state-owned corporations, so-called government-linked uh, corporations and private big business. Uh, AMNO even had its own corporations, like some other parties, like the Malaysian uh, Chinese Association. And until now, nobody really um, knows, despite the central leadership of AMNO, uh, what exactly this party owns. Yeah? Moreover, the whole bureaucracy in Malaysia, uh, including these state-owned corporations, um, were and maybe are to an extent still are indirectly controlled by AMNO. And all this uh, contributed, for example, to the well, well-known uh, 1MDB scandal a few years ago when almost 700 million US dollars were transferred to the private accounts of then uh, Prime Minister Najib 
uh, Razak and he again used at least parts of it for, for electoral campaigning by AMNO. In other countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, there's also a very close link between parties, candidates, and um, big business. In the Philippines, you have these old dynasties, the clans that rule the country since, well, maybe 100 years. In Indonesia, this is all discussed under the heading of oligarchy. Um, in Indonesia, some political parties are owned by these very rich people, and other parties are well, under the influence of these um, oligarchs. Many of them are media czars, and because of that, uh, control um, the whole debate on politics, especially during political uh, campaigns. Civil society is, in Indonesia, at least now, I would say, quite weak and not really able to push through some reforms. They were stronger a few years ago and were able uh, to, um, well, to support some political finance reforms, but these have been watered down in recent years. For example, the uh, Corruption Eradication Commission, the KPK, has been weakened a lot. So these are some of the main factors, I would say. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andreas. And it's very interesting uh, that you mention uh, the example of Malaysia. And actually, it's one of the few countries that actually doesn't have any specific regulation pertaining to political finance as of now. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, also, it was mentioned that uh, regulation of political finance can result in level playing field. But uh, does it really? Uh, so my next question is to uh, Rum Bizai. Uh, based on uh, researches and experiences that you have gathered on uh, gender equality and inclusion in politics, uh, what are the uh, interlinkages between political finance and gender? And does political finance really play an important role in um, bringing more women into politics? Thank you, Kushbu, and uh, greetings to everyone. The point that you raise is very Pertinent. In fact, I'd also noted that aspect about leveling the playing field and just interrogating it and reflecting on it in terms of uh, leveling the playing field to what extent? Because I think many times we, uh, we argue for leveling the playing field, of course, largely, essentially, maybe between one group of men and another group of men. And I have to put it bluntly like that because um, the challenge that we have is that our societies are very patriarchal. So when we are putting forward the narrative about leveling the playing field, essentially we are not going beyond and saying who are the main actors and beneficiaries of this leveling of the playing field? And to a very large extent, you see this is why, as, a, if, as an illustrative example, we still have only women constituting 25% of the world parliamentarians. So if you take about the 40,000 or 45,000 parliamentarians of the world, women are only 25% of that. And from all the research, Kushbu, as you have uh, asked that we have done, it's very clear. It's no, it's substantiated. There's evidence that financial obstacles are often identified as a major factor for the reason why women cannot and I know women are not a homogeneous group. So I'm talking about women with all their different identities in comparison to men also who are not a homogeneous group in relation to also their different identities. Women often have less access to resources than men. And we have found like, for instance, if I can cite the publication or knowledge resource that we've put together, which is titled Gender Public Funding, gender targeted public funding for political parties. It is very clear. And we know from even the examples that we are articulating here pertaining to Southeast Asia and the world over, just to be able to present yourself as a candidate, to identify yourself as a candidate for the political party nomination. And that is also another complicated field, the internal party democracy processes 
on the identification, nomination, and selection of candidates, which has become very commercialized. And we see the world over that a lot of women, most of the women, the majority of women, do not have the same amount and access to resources in order to even just consider themselves to be political party candidates. And in cases where that can happen, where some have the resources, you also even find that political parties tend to nominate women to winnable positions so that they can also continue to benefit from the resources that are that men have at their disposal. So the leveling playing field in its totality, if it's going to be uh, effective in terms of making sure that uh, at least 50% of the world population who identify as women are also included in positions of power and decision-making, the leveling of the playing field in terms of the regulatory frameworks that we have, we have, and UK has talked about it. Daisy also, everyone has made, made reference to the regulatory frameworks on political finance across the world. There is a need to start questioning the extent to which these regulatory frameworks are indeed gender sensitive, and they promote gender equality and women's empowerment in politics. Mind you, it is not just uh, about politics only, but we know these aspects are interconnected. So what happens with regards to economic empowerment measures and policies and strategies on economic empowerment will, of course, ultimately affect what happens in terms of having access to political financing and resources for campaigning. Therefore, the leveling playing field issue really has to be uh, broadened and strengthened in order to just to make sure it uh, guarantees access, participation, and representation. At this point, I think a lot of what is happening is about women just participating in politics, but their participation not being translated into meaningful and effective representation that is having women in these positions of power and decision-making. And as I have cited from the onset, political financing and access to financial resources is one of the major obstacles that prevents women from accessing uh, positions of power in decision-making at all levels. So and any leveling of the playing field really has to be that inclusive. It really has to be gender sensitive and drive the agenda for women's political empowerment as much as women are also empowered to participate and be represented in positions of decision making. Um, thank you very here. much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rumbi. I hear that uh, the initiatives uh, to improve women's political participation, particularly pertaining uh, to the use of money, uh, has to come from all factors and all uh, sections, including political parties themselves or via public funding, or even if there are private initiatives. But the idea is, as a society, uh, we need to up our game if we really want more women in politics and uh, enable them to play a meaningful role in, in politics. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very uh, apt uh, intervention, Rumbi. And uh, again, we have been talking a lot about public funding, gender-targeted public funding, and Daisy particularly spoke about uh, uh, the use of public funding. Uh, so my question uh, now is for uh, Daisy. Uh, so some countries in Southeast Asia, just like uh, other countries around the world, they uh, provide public funding to political parties. Uh, however, there is not much research on the effectiveness of public funding. In your opinion, uh, does public funding uh, really work uh, in reducing political parties' uh, reliance on private donations? Uh, what are your experiences or what does studies from Southeast Asia uh, tell you about that? Oh, thank you very much, Kushbu. Uh, I think, yeah, this is a very, uh, very, very good question, actually, whether or not uh, public funding can can really, uh, you know, make a difference, right? Uh, to reduce um, dependence to uh, corruption, basically, to reduce uh, the instances of soliciting uh, illegal funding uh, for political uh, parties. Well, actually, the, the, the answer is also, it really depends, you know, 
it really depends on um, on the situation of each country uh, itself. So basically, I can say uh, for Indonesia's case, um, up until 2019, I think um, the amount of uh, public funding or state subsidy is is quite dismal. Dismal, right? It's only 108 rupiahs per vote garnered by a political party. So it's a 76, 70, uh, not even 7.6 cents US dollar per vote up until 2019. And in 2019, the government uh, um, made a new law, uh, made a new uh, agreement. Then uh, it, it was increased tenfold. It became 1,000 rupees per uh, vote. So it's quite tenfold, you know, almost tenfold, and it's around 70, 70 cents uh, US dollars now. Um, so it means that, uh, for example, the, the biggest party in Indonesia, PDIP, they won 23 million votes in 2014, which means they will have 23 billion uh, uh, rupiahs for state, state subsidies. It's a huge amount. I mean, like from for us, you know, from outside, we saw uh, we feel like, oh, it's a lot of money. But actually, it's it doesn't even cover half of the party's. Uh, annual uh, funding necessity, basically. So uh, still, then the party would have to look for uh, sources of uh, other, you know, uh, uh, funding sources. And mostly uh, parties in Indonesia uh, would ask uh, money from political party members who are holding public office or who have a seat in the parliament. So uh, it the, the amount can be really big, you know, fifteen to forty percent of the salary would go to the party. So that's actually uh, one of the uh, biggest I item in the in the uh, political party's uh, uh, funding uh, source in Indonesia. So um, it is for Indonesia. I think it is a step towards uh, something good, you know, because uh, uh, giving public funding could reduce uh, the reliance on, 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 on illegal sources, reliance on uh, donation from oligarchs. I actually don't really like to use this word, this word very lightly. So big businesses um, also uh, to kind of reduce the, uh, what is that, the dependence uh, of, the, um, of the parties towards uh, on these uh, big businesses or big business. But again, like I said, uh, so far, the the Indonesian um, re, the Indonesian political party uh, budget report, uh, the report of uh, uh, income and expenditures, have not been done correctly, even on the state subsidy. Uh, the state subsidy that was very dismal, you know. So you can you can imagine how blurry it is for the non-state subsidy sources, right? So, so I think okay, uh, the the. Uh, Giving public funding is is good for political parties, but the most important thing again is the uh, accountability. It's the report. It's the auditing of the report, and it is the opening for public uh, scrutiny. That is very important, uh, so that uh, you know uh, political financing can be can be really uh, making a difference, uh, especially for the quality of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy. That was a very, very interesting. And you talked uh, a lot about uh, the issues of compliance and implementation, something that obviously we'll be talking about, but at a later stage, uh, because right now I want to uh, get to uh, Yuki. Uh, who is the co-author of uh, the introductory chapter in the publication that uh, we are launching today, uh, Political Party Finance Reform in Southeast Asia. Uh, Yuki, can you share some of the key findings uh, presented uh, in the paper, particularly pertaining to Southeast Asia? Of course. Um, thanks for the question, Kishwe. So um, this report um, that has just been launched today, uh, International Idea has a, uh, has a fortunate to contribute a chapter to provide a comparative um, uh, assessment. So um, in this short paper, uh, what we did actually to look at, uh, at the legal framework of those four countries concerned and the respect project, but also benchmark the results against the, uh, the more um, regional and global 
context. So we also look at the uh, global standard and then the scores in the southeastern region at large, so that uh, intentions to place those four countries vis-a-vis -vis the global uh, standard. And then through this very interesting exercise, um, we identified um, uh, uh, several uh, very common similar challenges uh, leading to political finance. Um, I think some of the challenges are already being touched by the uh, Daisy and Andreas and Rubitai as well, but um, it's always uh, nice to repeat the very important message, so allow me. Um, there are three, uh, lovely three messages I like to convey to um, respond to your questions. One is the, um, there's a clear legislative shortcomings in across all those uh, regulations in four countries, as well as in some cases, absence of regulation. Uh, entirely. So <laughs> the case of Malaysia is a case in point. Uh, there's no dedicated political finance laws at all uh, in a country currently. And certainly this um, is, is a major issue this uh, we like a country to consider uh, introducing a framework to, to, to frame the influence of money in politics. But even for the, uh, the other three countries, um, although there are some sort of political finance regulations in place, um, <laughs> And our, our assessment sort of identifies there are still certain um, loopholes or shortcomings um, uh, that, that make them rather incomplete. Um, some of the examples um, that I like to mention is one is the uh, regulation relating to self-funding. For example, uh, candidates, uh, political parties are funding their own campaigns um, in terms of regulation around that. Um, uh, it, it's in Southeast Asia, it's rather unregulated area. The same goes to um, uh, taking loans uh, by political parties um, whereas uh, this is a rather well-regulated area in, in, in other world and in other parts of the world, uh, this is rather um, untouched. As well as also um, uh, commercial activities undertaken by political parties and then revenues raised by from such uh, businesses. Again, um, I'm not to say this is the wrong exercise to say, but uh, uh, the regulation needs to be definitely be in place uh, to, to, to make sure there's a transparency and accountability in political parties' business operations and the revenues raised from such activities. But uh, uh, it's rather untouched in many uh, regulations in Southeast Asia. And again, that really underscores sort of the uh, uh, tight business government relations that are mentioned by the other speakers as well. And, and then also um, when it comes to the second challenges, um, it's challenge is it, the uh, issue of implementation. I think DZ uses the word accountability, but I think of what I'm trying to get at is more or less the same. But so the regulations are there. And then also in almost all countries, there's one or more uh, public body that are responsible for political finance oversight. But we keep seeing the recurring scandals or alleged uh, political finance uh, misconduct. And that points to the fact that probably those oversight agencies are not necessarily uh, sufficiently um, um, staffed to conduct meaningful uh, oversight or lack political independence or uh, mandate or, or one way or I mean, one of those or combination of those factors. And then also, um, uh, when it comes to implementation, um, we also identify the uh, lack of reliable data is also a, a, a difficulties or obstacle for, for anyone to make um, objective decisions. Um, even it was impacted our research uh, to conduct this paper as well. Um, when you look at those data, I mean, it's very difficult to have a very reliable um, data sets in relation to, for example, the number of sanctions applied to uh, misconduct or uh, compliance rate uh, of political parties submitting uh, political finance reports to oversight agencies in time, for example, or or how much of, of the political finance reports are disclosed in a, in a set time frame, for example. And without those um, well, we call it data or, or, or you know, uh, evidence, it's actually very difficult to uh, measure the effectiveness of the functioning of the political finance systems in place. So um, 
uh, as well as um, closing regulatory uh, legislative loopholes, um, focusing on implementation and also start developing sort of reliable indicators to measure, monitor and then measure the uh, effectiveness of the regulations in place. That exercise is currently quite uh, weak in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia in particular. And also lastly, uh, the point I want to make is also some of the reason that, that the slow uh, progress uh, in political finance reform is sometimes also due to the lack of capacity on the political party side as well. I mean, although they may have a political will to comply uh, regulations, but they may lack sufficient um, expertise to conduct meaningful or accurate uh, bookkeeping practices, for example. Uh, so in that case, that also underscores a need to provide uh, more capacity building training uh, to political parties, particularly those uh, who are new or smaller parties, they they may lack um, sufficient sort of um, capacities on, on their end to comply with uh, political finance regulations. Um, there are many more, and then also there are some emerging challenges that I'd like to touch on as well, but, uh, but uh, yeah, these are the very, at a quick glance, some of the uh, key uh, findings that, that I think is worth mentioning here. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Yuki. So much food for thought and so many issues to discuss, uh, but we will hopefully reach all those questions at some stage. Uh, but you raised very important issue of uh, transparency and accountability, which definitely is very important. Uh, but I would like to ask now, Andreas, to please highlight, like, what do we mean by transparency and accountability? And how can that be enhanced? How can transparency and accountability be enhanced when it comes to the issues of political finance in, in Southeast Asia? Okay, this question is um, related uh, to the other question, whether there are regulatory loopholes and, and um, what can we do against it? And, and Yuki already said there are so many problems concerning political finance in Southeast Asia. Electoral or election commissions are usually not really powerful, but politically controlled or understaffed. Uh, corruption eradication commissions are weak. There's a lacking protection of whistleblowers, a misuse of state owned corporations or state resources in general. Uh, financial reports are incomplete. There's no real oversight and sanctioning is also often non-existent. So I would say that all these loopholes show that political elites are very smart in circumventing regulations and in creating actively regulations that cannot really be uh, implemented effectively. Um, because of all that, um, reforms are very difficult. I think only during critical junctures, um, when opposition by political parties is strong and combined um, with civil society um, activities, it is possible to um, push through um, fundamental reforms, like, like constitutional reforms in Thailand in 1997 or um, a range of reforms in Indonesia in the early 2000s. And um, I think now uh, there's a very good chance that the whole party finance system, you, you mentioned it uh, already in Malaysia, that's non-existent uh, currently uh, could be overhauled. Um, I think this is ne necessary because there are almost no regulations um, and they are well, they can easily circumvent the few regulations that exist. Uh, but now in Malaysia, a party opposition is very strong and the current new government is under pressure to come to terms with the opposition coalition. And just yesterday and today, they um, um, came with these confident and supply agreements. That means for the first time in Malaysian history, the opposition and the governing um, coalition work very closely and, well, they start to um, politically reform the whole polity. Hopefully, we, we do not yet know. Um, and we have to have in mind that the whole reform process in Malaysia started, I think, in the mid-2000s and the most important 
civil society actor at this time, maybe until uh, today, is Bercy, the uh, movement for clean elections. So we see that reforms are, I think, uh, probable, but especially if there are um, formal or maybe informal coalitions between opposition parties and uh, civil society actors. And then um, even the political finance system could be reformed fundamentally, I would say. Uh, thank you very much, Andres. And I'll continue with you as a follow-up question to what you said and what also you keep us mentioning about the, uh, both the capacity of the oversight agencies as well as their independence, um, which, of course, is a very important balance to strike. But uh, what what uh, is the problem uh, here in the region? Uh, are there uh, other oversight bodies uh, not independent enough? Uh, are they not capacitated enough or do they not have enough resources to carry out their mandate? What exactly is the problem that we're talking about here in terms of implementation of the regulations and how the capacities of oversight bodies come into play? Uh, Andreas, that question was for you as a follow-up. <laughs> I thought... Excuse me, sorry. Could you repeat the question? Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the capacities of oversight agencies and the independence thereof. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you as a follow-up question to your intervention on what is the uh, problem in the region? Are the oversight bodies not independent enough or they don't have enough capacities and what kind of capacities uh, they could use, for instance? Yeah, I could um, again point at the type of regime. If you have electoral authoritarian system, then of course these oversight agencies are not not really powerful because uh, the ruling elites have no interest to strengthen these agencies. And um, well, we we could now talk about different countries. In Malaysia, you have the, the election commission that is under control. Uh, of the prime minister. Uh, and in Indonesia, you have different oversight agencies, but I think uh, they are understaffed and they are not really able to function well. Um, I wouldn't know about East Timor, but I guess it's more or less the same. These agencies are usually understaffed. Um, and at the same time, the court system in many of these countries is uh, well, not maybe not fully independent. And so that means there are usually uh, no strong sanctions. Yeah. I know in Thailand there were. Sometimes they would ban whole parties, but um, this instrument again was politicized and maybe not part of a well functioning political finance system. But in Indonesia and Malaysia, Oversight and sanctioning is, uh, as far as I know, very weak. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, Rumbi, now I will ask the next question uh, to you. Uh, you highlighted the challenges women face in accessing finance uh, to run campaigns uh, or run for office. Uh, but for sure, there must be some good examples and good practices that we can all learn from uh, from across the world or even from the region in how money can be made accessible for women who want to run for office? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, sure. Definitely, uh, Kushbo. It's not like there are no efforts whatsoever. There are some efforts, but also remaining mindful of the fact that the efforts, what we are seeing, the progress is very slow and uneven across the world. Um, because these efforts, if I may build upon what I was saying earlier on, it cannot be one size fits all. And also it's not going to be effective if we have fragmented or ad hoc measures. The issues pertaining to gender equality and women's empowerment are so interconnected, interconnected in terms of uh, the socialization, the social constructs, uh, the perceptions and uh, attitudes towards women's leadership, men's leadership, 
and the entire setup, as I said, of our patriarchal systems that then have a profound effect on the political party systems, what happens within political parties and the electoral uh, systems. And having said that, indeed, there are countries where if we look at what we have on the political finance database from the data that we have for 180 countries, it shows that 70% of those 180 countries receive some form of public funding, political parties for their activities. And out of those 70%, only 17%, not 17% of the countries have gender targeted measures. Um, the examples that we can cite, for instance, are countries such as Finland. Finland is actually regarded as one of the countries in the first countries in the world in 1974, when they ensured that a certain proportion of public funding is earmarked to activities that target transformation. You know, it wasn't just about, you know, ensuring that a certain number of women get into positions of power and decision making through the political parties, intra-party democracy processes, but it was broad transformation of attitudes. So the public funding is there to ensure that there's gender equality. So broadly, it will not just be political parties say we have a certain number of women, but also what is it that they do, their practices, their attitudes, the way of life from a gender equality perspective. We also have countries such as France. France introduced uh, gender uh, targeted measures like in 2000. But if we look at the region where, for instance, a country such as Timor-Leste, where the gender targeted funding is connected and linked to compliance with gender quotas. And there are several countries that have that, um, that measure in place where gender quotas compliance is required to be, is a requirement in order to be included in the ballot and also then to be eligible for public funding. That is happening in Timor Leste, as I've mentioned. It's happening in South Korea. It's happening in Bolivia. It's happening in Mongolia, in Belgium, in Costa Rica, in Spain, in Argentina. So, but as I said at the onset, Koshvo, the efforts are still very uh, minimal and they are in a few countries. So if we take the entire political finance database information that we have, it only shows that as of 2020, only 30 countries across the world have some measures on gender targeted funding in order to transform attitudes or support the activities of um, on gender equality and women's empowerment, but that's only 30% of the countries that are on the gender quotas, that, that are on the political finance database or out of the 180 countries. Yet we know of the 180 countries, at least 70% have access to public funding. Why is it it's 70% and then 17% for gender targeted measures? Why can't it just be 70-70? If any country has provisions for political parties to have access to public funding, which comes from public resources and you know the requirements that have already been articulated for accountability and reporting. Why is that provision for gender equality not mainstreamed in all these public funding um, legal frameworks and political parties accessing the funding from the government? Why is it not done the same in order to ensure gender equality and women's empowerment. So the efforts are there. There are several other countries as well, even like Sweden. For instance, Sweden, they ensure that a lot of the gender targeted funding goes to the women's wing. And I'm mentioning women's swings here because I know several countries in Southeast Asia and across uh, the different regions of the world, political parties have established women's wings, but we need to start also paying close attention to the functions and role of those women's swings. 
are they meant to be conduits for ensuring that women can get into positions of power and decision-making, or they just do the hospitality function in the political parties, saving drinks and preparing food and ensuring that the decor for the political party meetings is in order. So it's a combination. Like I say, it's a combination. The gender quotas are there. They have to be reinforced with gender-targeted public funding. They also have them to be reinforced by transformation of attitudes and perspectives and perceptions, which then relates to another component of the media, because that has also a role to play. Thank you, Koshbu. Thank you very much, Rumbi. That was uh, really interesting. And again, you touched upon an issue that uh, Daisy was discussing as well, that uh, while public funding can be effective, we also need to look at how uh, it is allocated and how it is distributed. And this also reflects on uh, how it eventually also leads to more women in politics. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Daisy, now I'll go to you. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, Preludem, which is based in Indonesia, we have a lot of uh, audience uh, tuning in from Indonesia, and I'm very uh, sure that they're interested in this uh, topic on uh, political finance in Indonesian uh, context. So I want to ask, what are the unique circumstances and specific challenges that um, Indonesia is facing in its quest to reform political party finance? Uh, thank you very much, Rushbu. I think a lot of uh, the audience know more than me about this, actually. But um, at the risk of um, uh, saying something everybody already knows. So. Uh, we, we know that uh, political parties, especially in a large country like Indonesia, is in need of massive, massive financial sources, right? To finance their activities, also to uh, basically to, to just survive in the, in, this, in the political competition. Uh, even outside of electoral period, uh, financing uh, their organizational structural um, uh, necessities uh, to finance uh, educational uh, programs. Um, we, we call this uh, also in Bahasa, kaderisasi, you know, recruitment and training of new cadres uh, and also organizational consolidation involving national, regional, down to the village level of branches and structures. However, there is also a lack of regulations uh, which constitute a major challenge in this matter. Um, we have law number two, 2008, and law number two, 2011, regulating political party finance, but some of the stipulations inside the uh, laws are a bit ambiguous. Um, there, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, there's lack of, um, what's that, the mechanism for, for accountability. Parties are only obliged to make annual budget reports, but the reports are only, for example, audited by their own uh, auditor. Uh, uh, there's no access for public scrutiny, and there's also a lack of sanction mechanism, basically, for violation of regulations. Uh, and I think uh, Andreas also mentioned about uh, the weak uh, how do you call that, uh, oversight uh, institutions. Um, so uh, I think th those, are, those are the things that are, uh, you know, lacking in Indonesia. Uh, for, uh, actually, th the laws regulate that party financing has several sources, uh, membership fees, uh, member donation, non-member donations, private donation and st state subsidy. Like I said before, state subsidy and member Membership fees are the most dismal ones, uh, at least until 2019. 2019, there was a tenfold increase in the state subsidy. Uh, but uh, the lack of uh, public finance uh, for the political parties make political parties trying to offset the cost by uh, uh, illegal uh, sources, by illegal uh, soliciting illegal uh, donations or... Um, or uh, getting money from 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 members who are uh, who are uh, in the parliament or who have a public office. So uh, basically, those are uh, what is happening in Indonesia. Also, uh, there's another thing um, in Indonesia. Uh, there are several. Uh, Andreas also mentioned it. There are several uh, oversight institutions. Uh, for example, the General General Election Commission. 
and the election supervisory, so the General Election Commission K, uh, K, KPU, uh, national supervisory uh, uh, body, uh, election supervisor supervisory body, Bawaslu, um, the state auditors, B BPK, and the national police, right? So there are four. Uh, but there's really no regulation who holds the principal responsibility for investigating and imposing sanctions in Indonesia. So when there's a, a breach of uh, regulations, they are waiting for each other, you know? So, so there's really no, um, there's like a special designation. Okay, now the national police goes first or something like that. So there's no such thing as that. So it would be great. I mean, going forward, if Indonesia could uh, think about uh, think about uh, designating one one specific uh, uh, what's that um, um, oversight institution to take this responsibility. And there's also there's also a lack of. I mean, this is my observation. There's also a lack of like partnership with watchdogs, right? It is important. Watchdogs are very very important, especially when there's in regional level, there's really no interaction between countries in, in, in Southeast Asia. We all know ASEAN is a consensus-based uh, organization, so there, there will not be any, uh, well, it's unlikely there's going to be a, a, a regional level common mechanism for political finance reform, right? So not like OECD or not like, uh, what's that, uh, the uh, Open Government Partnership or something like that. So, uh, um, so the, the partnership between watchdogs and uh, oversight institutions are very important, and that's actually still lacking in in, in Indonesia. Where well, it's actually very important for watchdogs to be to be more uh, to be more active here, because watchdog, especially the internationally structured one, you know, like International Idea or, or Transparency International. They can be. Uh, they can. They can talk to each other at regional level. You know. So. So it's. Uh, it's. It's very important. That's what is lacking in Indonesia at the moment. Um, yeah. But there is already um, a discourse of adding to the uh, public finance, which is a very good uh, discourse. Even to the uh, number. The number even uh, amounts to six trillion rupiahs in two thousand twenty-three. So that's actually something that is. Uh, uh, we are excited about, but also we are very wary about how the account accountability uh, process is going to be because uh, it's it's a, a, a huge amount of money and uh, it needs to be uh, handled very properly. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daisy. And you raised a very important point that uh, just in political independence and capacity of oversight bodies is uh, not sufficient. We also need a clear, they also need a clear mandate to, uh, you know, do their functions. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and Yuki, now I want to come to you. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about some emerging challenges. So in the report, in the paper that you co-authored, you have also highlighted some of the emerging challenges that uh, the region should, uh, you know, start thinking about or is already facing. Uh, would you be able to highlight some of those uh, issues, please? Um, of course, and then, uh, yeah, there, there have already been many points raised by speakers, and then I really love to dig each one of them much deeper. But uh, for, for the interest of time, I'm also, I uh, want to highlight a little bit of the emerging issues that, uh, that, we, that we believe uh, that's going to be an issue in, in Southeast Asia as well. Um, I'll briefly mention about three uh, issues as emerging, or well, some of them actually being around for a little while. So it could be considered a persisting challenge possibly. But uh, one is the um, definitely um, the issue of uh, third party campaigning. So uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, um, we often identify the third parties as the um, campaigners, but neither political parties nor uh, candidates. So often those third party groups include um, supposedly independent uh, research foundations or in some cases, um, civil society groups or uh, faith groups in some times. Um, but uh, in some cases, often the times, uh, those third party groups, um, when election times comes, they pour quite large uh, amount of resources into campaigns and um, in favor of or in opposition to a certain candidates or political parties and um, their voice or their campaign uh, 
uh, often have a very significant bearing on the outcome of the elections. So in this context, uh, we believe that certain regulations, particularly spending limit, uh, as to how much those third party campaigners uh, could spend during election campaigns, um, should be subject to some level of regulation. But uh, the third party campaigning uh, is, is rather new uh, areas in, in many parts of the world. And when we look at the uh, Southeast Asia, certainly uh, it's very untouched. Uh, I consider definitely this area is needs further investigation and necessary uh, uh, updating the uh, provisions corresponding to their spending. And then also um, second area is the is very fitting and very timely in times of the pandemic uh, that we are all in is that um, many aspects of political finance practices uh, from from raising donations to receiving donations to reporting financial reports and disclosing political finance reports have become uh, increasingly digital in, in many countries in the world. Um, if you think about it, um, especially due to the social um, distancing uh, protocols uh, placed in, in many countries, uh, political parties cannot hold uh, regular uh, rallies, for example. And in, in many countries, for example, political parties start utilizing um, crowdfunding sites or, or introducing some sort of mobile apps to correct uh, small donations, for example. Um, equally, uh, many political parties and candidates are spending quite large amounts of uh, financial resources on um, online advertisements uh, through social media platforms, for example. Um, but however, these um, technologies uh, definitely has a lot of positives. You know, they they reach out to grassroots level uh, voters, um, relatively cheap way of political parties engaged with larger amount of voters, which is great. Um, however, um, if used well, both intentionally or unintentionally, but uh, without under correct supervision, could easily circumvent existing regulations. For example, many countries have ban on anonymous donations or a ban on uh, donations coming from foreign sources. But uh, uh, the current lack of transparency uh, surrounding, for example, online uh, advertisements, uh, we are not actually really know uh, who's actually paying for certain uh, advertisements or can we consider it as an in-kind donation from donors? I mean, how do we have to deal with it? How do we report it in the political finance reports, for example? So um, it's still a very new area as we speak, and many oversight agencies we spoke um, are struggling to regulate how best to um, increase transparency in this area, because often it's it's not just only the responsibility of oversight agencies, it requires a cooperation uh, of private uh, companies as well. So um, it's not an uh, easy task to do, but however, um, we only see this digitalization trend will only continue to grow in the future. So certainly this is an issue that we all need to collectively uh, tackle. Then uh, third, uh, a challenge that I would like to mention is, is something somewhat uh, similar to what Dizzy mentioned as well. She also mentioned the struggles and difficulties of interagency cooperation. So often when you look at countries, um, there are a few uh, competing or, or overlapping agencies that have a very similar mandate when it comes to political finance, uh, but often sometimes uh, uh, issues fall in between agencies and they're not really uh, touched by uh, uh, any single government agency. I mean, this is, has been a long-standing problem, but uh, issues like uh, digitalization has actually had another layer of difficulties on top of that, for example. So if you consider other countries, um, issue, issues relating to digitalization or um, uh, information integrity, uh, this often uh, lies with the responsibility of um, uh, information commissioner or uh, department of media and public information sort of uh, those are the traditionally and uh, actors that are not really active in the area of political finance regulation but uh, um, because the surroundings uh, are changing uh, so rapidly um, there is a way I mean there is a definite need for oversight agencies to um, uh, develop some sort of the interagency co collaboration or mechanism to um, allow them to um, 
uh, exchange information more more easily and then also uh, cooperate uh, as an one basis. That mechanism is currently lacking in many countries. And then in addition to that, uh, I just need to highlight that um, also political finance is definitely one main area for corruption, as all the speakers mentioned. But um, we also need to be very, very realistic um, in the sense that to realize and acknowledge uh, just implementing political finance regulation is not going to be effective to mitigate the risk of money in politics. I mean, there are certainly other avenues uh, to, to influence politics by using big money. For example, um, public procurement system is often identified as one of those risk areas or uh, is there uh, effective lobbying regulations in the country, for example? you know, the way political interactions uh, are initiated by the corporations. Is it subject to regulations? You know, so um, it's another, in addition to interagency cooperation, uh, it's also important to consider uh, placing political finance regulation uh, in a much broader anti-corruption strategy. So putting, connecting political finance with other issues such as um, already mentioned by panelists, for example, whistleblower protections, you know, or connecting it with other uh, measures, um, uh, for example, asset disclosure mechanism that's often in place in Southeast Asia. But uh, those data are actually make it, you know, compatible or, you know, or, or connecting those data sets, for example, to, to make um, oversight more effective, for example. So connecting uh, political finance with larger anti-corruption efforts is also uh, a challenge and uh, a task uh, ahead for all, uh, all countries in Southeast Asia, I would say. Uh, thank you very much, Yuki, uh, and for highlighting uh, very important issues that uh, globally, but at the same time, also very, very relevant to the region, including the issue of online campaign financing, which is bound to grow. It has already grown by leaps and bounds, especially during the times of COVID, and it's going to grow even further. So thank you very much for sharing those insights. I just want to remind our audience that uh, we are nearly at the end of the formal questions and answers round. So please uh, write your question in the Q&A uh, chat box, or if you want to directly ask your question, please raise your hand so that we can moderate. Uh, I have a, just a couple of more questions for the panelists, but we are very, very uh, excited to hear uh, from our audience uh, itself. Uh, you can use the Q&A chat. I have a question, which chat box should be used? So please use the Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, Andreas, uh, Daisy mentioned, uh, the need for uh, CSOs, uh, regional cooperation. Yuki also talked about interagency collaboration. Uh, you have worked in the academia for very long. Uh, you have worked in think tank for quite a bit. Uh, what role do you think uh, think tanks or international organizations or uh, you know academia can play in you know bridging this divide that we face in terms of data yuki was mentioning that there is no reliable data oftentimes that can be used for you know uh, evidence based advocacy or evidence based policy reform so what role do you think can uh, can uh, we play as academia or as think tanks well i think we need different types of research. We still need um, the research that already exists. For example, in, in your report on political party finance uh, reform in Southeast Asia, one finds very valuable data on expenses for very different activities and items, for example, details uh, on regulations and their effects on the costs of um, in election campaigns. I think we still, of course, need all this. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, the articles I have read on Indonesia and on Malaysia in this report. And well, that still is very helpful. But we all know that this is, of course, not um, sufficient. I think we could need more uh, comparative studies in order to identify best practices. Um, for example, how could we use state funding in an effective way? Are there um, good examples in other countries? And if there are, are they transferable to um, other countries? And then um, it was just mentioned that we may, should not only focus on political finance and all these regulations, but you have to see the bigger picture. That means 
um, the political economy of um, party politics, of electioneering in general. That means we need to know more about, for example, the donors. Who donates um, money? What are the linkages between politicians and business people? Under which circumstances um, do they work? Um, who are actually um, the people behind parties and candidates? I mean, if I think about Indonesia, we, we mostly hear rumors, but, but we do not really know who, for example, um, has financed the campaign of uh, presidential candidates, for example. I, I don't want to mention names. Um, so we, we need research on the political economy going beyond um, political finance. The problem is that it is very difficult to analyze. It's very difficult to really um, interview these people. And then Yuki already mentioned a lot of this. Um, there are many new issues coming up. We need more research pertaining to new social media, for example. Uh, the use of cryptocurrencies that has been uh, mentioned in, in your report the organization of black campaigning on the internet, the employment of um, buzzers, or in, in Malaysia they are called cyber troopers, the role of spin doctors and uh, survey institutes, um, and of, of third-party campaigners that was just uh, mentioned, new forms of fundraising, or the role of voluntary supporters. Um, so I, I think the campaigns are currently um, changing tremendously in the whole region. And um, maybe we also need new times of uh, regulations and uh, new forms of oversight. Yeah, you need, for example, um, independent agencies able to observe um, different activities on the Internet. And, of course, we need research on all that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for this very comprehensive response uh, and a lot of uh, things to think about on how we can uh, continue working on, on generating more data, generating more evidence, which we can then eventually use for advocacy and uh, reform purposes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my uh, final question is for Rumbi, which is also has which has also been raised actually by one of our participants about uh, the use of uh, um, political finance to improve political participation of marginalized groups. Uh, Rumbi, you talked a lot about women's political participation and how um, political finance can play as an equalizer. Uh, what about other groups, uh, other marginalized groups, such as uh, people living with disabilities, uh, LGBTI groups, or um, young people or other minorities, uh, how can public finance, political finance play an important role in, in bringing more uh, people from these groups uh, into, into the politics? Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, Kushbu, a lot needs to be done. I think um, what I've explained with relation to women, now you need to think of it when it comes to other marginalized groups, people living with disabilities and uh, or people who are differently abled or people from uh, who are non-binary non people or different uh, ethnic backgrounds or, you know, all the different multiple identities that people have. So you can actually imagine that as we, as it is right now, not much has been done in terms of uh, earmarking public funding to address the issues of inclusion of uh, marginalized groups. We've just dwelt a lot on women in, as a particular segment, but you need to take, we need to look at the same principles again, because it's about readdressing the underrepresentation of different segments in our populations. And of course, addressing the issue of over-representation of one segment of uh, the populations. Therefore, we still see that a lot has not been done in relation to the other marginalized groups. If at all, we have challenges 
for instance, if I can mention the youth across the world, one of the issues and major obstacle that they face is the lack of uh, access to financial resources for campaigning. So, and we have cross-cutting dimensions. When we are talking about the youth, we have youth who are women, men, non-binary, living with disabilities or from different ethnic and religious backgrounds. And until and unless, as I mentioned before, the efforts that we put in place with regards to public funding are implemented in a very holistic approach, not piecemeal or just targeting one particular aspect. Because if, for instance, we say we provide political funding to political parties, why not in the funding of those political parties include all the different criteria that need to be covered? For instance, if we're setting up political parties, they probably in a number of contexts, uh, requirements that political parties should not be non-discriminatory, they should be inclusive. And why should we not then have legal frameworks and provisions that expand on those components? What does it mean? So it's not just about uh, not discriminating against women, but not discriminating against people who are differently abled, non-binary people or different people or the youth, and then we specify how public funding can be used to address the specific needs of the different segments of the population in order to address the representation gap without necessarily uh, stepping up those measures to be as holistic as I am outlining, we will still find that the initiatives will solve one aspect but then they don't really go the long haul of dealing with the issues of uh, sustaining the interventions. Ultimately, I think our principles, if we are looking at uh, what we are putting forward in this uh, webinar, are issues of um, what's the whole argument around the 2030 agenda, leave no one behind. That's the central theme. So how do we use political finance or regulatory frameworks for on poly money in politics to be inclusive and not just inclusive of women, but of different groups? And right now across the world, and you, uh, Kushbu and Yuki are in a better place to speak to that with all the information that we have on our political finance database, not much has been done beyond even the minimal uh, reflections that I have shared just regarding women. So you can imagine about the other multiple uh, identities that people carry, nothing much has been done. And this is a challenge that we have to uh, step up to the, across the different parts of uh, the world and in the region as well, in Southeast Asia. Thank you so much, uh, Rumbi, and very rightly said uh, uh, that there is very little that has been done, uh, and uh, but our fight will continue and we will work together with stakeholders to uh, to do more research and collect evidence on what works, uh, what is missing and what needs to be done. So thank you very much for that. And I hope uh, uh, that the question posed by our audience, uh, Kafi Adlan Hafiz was answered uh, with Rumbi's intervention. Thank you very much Kafi for that question. Uh, now we formally end the question and answer round, uh, but we are taking uh, questions from audience and we already have received uh, several questions. Uh, and my next question is uh, from U.S. Kinawas and he has raised his hand. So he probably would like to Recording ask this stopped. question directly to one Recording of our in panelists. progress. Um, so could we give uh, the mic to U.S. Kinawas, please? Um, yes, I think you also type his questions. In, uh, uh, we in can, I think there might be some technical uh, issue with his mic. So I will read the question that has been given by US. Uh, it is for either Yuki or Andreas, any of either of you 
can take this question. Uh, he's talking about um, that in many uh, APAC countries, uh, detecting and monitoring the movement of money is a perennial problem. Could you talk a bit more about the variation in the region regarding states' ability to monitor the money movement? Does it correlate with the country's quality of democracy? Um, Andreas, perhaps you can take this question. Um, yeah, but maybe Yuki can add. I think he knows more about the regulation <laughs> uh, in detail. I could talk about Malaysia. I mean, Malaysia is the most glaring example where hundreds of millions of dollars were uh, or came as a donation from somebody of the Saudi Arabian monarchy. That's at least what the prime minister, the former prime minister uh, Najib Razak said. And well, the impression is that before 2018, um, well, the movement of money was not really uh, controlled <laughs> and it was more a kind of private affair of uh, those members of the political elite who were interested to use one MDB money for different reasons. But, well, um, detecting and monitoring the movement of money in Indonesia or the Philippines, I can only imagine that this will also be difficult and that, of course, there is a connection to the type of regime. I mean, the more democratic a regime is, the better is the monitoring usually, I would say. But Yuki, maybe, maybe you can add. Yuki, yes, please. Uh, thanks, Andres. I think this is a, like one of those million dollar questions, really. It's very hard to answer. But uh, um, no, but I try to be concise, but uh, I like to give you um, concrete um, practices that other countries uh, adapt. First of all, um, this program is particularly difficult in a, in a cash-based a society like uh, many parts of Asia. Uh, I'm talking about tracking the money in politics because of course um, all the money that are often given under the table is, is very hard to be uh, detected and especially at local level or the regional level in, in Southeast Asia. Um, one cannot expect uh, people to use uh, credit cards or bank transfer to make donations. So that's often the root cause of it as well. But but if we were to speak a little bit more uh, global trend uh, um, and how other countries are trying to tr increase transparency in the, in, in the flow of money and then increase the ability to track um, uh, financial uh, resources, one is definitely mandating or requesting uh, uh, donors to, to use um, uh, bank transfers so that, uh, you know, um, uh, the trace will be uh, identified very easily digitally. But also, um, and then this, uh, especially in the Europe, uh, North America, I mean, this has become a very um, prominent feature uh, rather than accepting cash, so to say, but uh, asking donors to use uh, wire transfer uh, to, to political parties. Or uh, again, also uh, in relation to this is the, uh, and again, the other alternative is to, uh, strengthening the law and requiring uh, the disclosure um, provisions. And for example, not only donor identities uh, to be uh, required, but I think that's the main issue. I mean, in some countries, the law doesn't even require the political parties to disclose their donor details. I think that's very important uh, to, to, to have certain transparency uh, to, as to who's giving money to which political party. But also, um, uh, for example, um, beneficial ownership. Uh, that's another issue, for example. So many corporations uh, provide uh, donations to political parties, but um, if the public cannot know uh, who actually owns that corporation, um, it's again, it's very difficult uh, for the CSO and media and then other uh, concerned citizens alike to really understand who is trying to influence the public decisions making. So, um, uh, and then also by knowing the uh, who's giving the uh, donations to political parties, we can also link that information to, for example, other data sets such as public procurement information, so that we can see if there's a correlation, if the big donors giving the donation to, to political parties, uh, they're more likely to receive public contracts after the election, for example. So then we can really uh, close the cycle of the um, flow of money in politics. 
So um, really requiring uh, transparency is is one um, major step forward. And then uh, the second is if if there is any sort of IT infrastructure in place or good level of internet penetration across society, um, making uh, aspects some aspects of oversight or political finance uh, a little bit more digital, it certainly gives you a little bit more um, corruption proof, uh, so to say, although it's not perfect, but certainly it's, uh, it's better than the uh, paper-based uh, oversight and implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas and uh, Yuki, both for your uh, very insightful remarks. Uh, and I hope you, is, you have received your, your answer. Uh, our next question is uh, from uh, Ika uh, Priyar Yani, uh, and it is, she's posing it to uh, all speakers. Uh, what is the most effective way to regulate political finance? Is it through laws? or through government regulations, electoral regulation, or political party regulation? What are other country experiences and what could be relevant for Indonesia? Um, perhaps uh, um, Daisy would like to answer this question and any other panelists, please feel free to join in uh, with your response as well. So basically in Southeast Asia, uh, each countries have their own political party laws. Uh, uh, more than one, actually. Uh, in, in case of Malaysia, there are two. Uh, and in Indonesia, there's, I don't know, several, actually. So uh, I think I think the legal framework, the laws are very important. But also what is more important is, is the, um, it's the, um, the, the willingness of uh, the political parties to, to abide by the law and also uh, the uh, capacity for uh, oversight uh, agencies to monitor the, you know, the, the, the implementation of the law, and also for uh, the national police to be able to you know, uh, sanction or um, punish you know, political parties that are not uh, uh, doing things in accordance to the law. So, uh, so the rule of law is is very very important. Um, the, yeah, but what what I said also uh, the most important thing is also the willingness, you know. So that it's it's more it's it's something that is more than you know obeying the law, but it's also something uh, that the political political parties themselves uh, are are willing to really uh, uh, you know abide by by what is. Uh, correct uh, political governance that are correct and so as to you know uh, um, ensure political financing to be clean and to be uh, to have a, a good quality of democracy that is sustainable I think that's that's also for Indonesia thank you thank you very much Daisy um, uh, yes Rumbi please yes uh, yeah I just want to build on what Daisy has said because the question asks us whether it's the it's the law or the regulations and electoral regulation or political party regulation in fact it's a combination of all these aspects uh, that the participant has asked uh, because the, the to regulate political finance in isolation it's not going to work we need also to connect it to what is happening within the political party regulations. If, for instance, uh, issues of accountability and transparency are not anchored in the political party regulations or in the conduct of political parties or the conduct of politics in the DNA of politics in a country, even if we regulate political finance with very strict laws, it might work to a certain extent, but as Daisy was saying, you find that in the long term, because there's no political will and it's not connected to several aspects. So we cannot like separate the, the issues. Political party regulation, electoral processes regulations, political finance regulations, all those aspects 
need to be combined because they have an impact on each other. And I think one of the aspects also that could also come out very clearly in this uh, discussion in relation to this question is even the regulation on access to media, who gets access to media in time during the campaigning and which type of media and what media are they using? Of course, we know there's so much happening in terms of online campaigning and under the online campaigning issue, we see also the dynamics that are playing out on increased violence against women online, which is very difficult to regulate and track to a certain extent. So these aspects are interconnected. We need to look at um, all the different dimensions and the relations that it has ultimately in whether the integrity of money in politics is maintained and can be sustained. Thank you so much, Rumbi, and a very apt way to uh, put a close to our question and answer round since we don't have any more. The idea that we cannot work in isolation, everything is interconnected, and this has, an, this has been an issue that has been raised consistently about the role of uh, different parties or different agencies about interagency coordination, the role of CSOs, how um, you know issue of political finance has to be put into a broader anti-corruption agenda, and how it has to be mentioned and addressed in every regulation pertaining to parties or finance or elections. So thank you very much for that insight. With this, we come to the closure of uh, question and answer round since we don't have any. Uh, but if any of the speakers would like to uh, give a closing remark or to add anything in what we have discussed today, I, I open the floor for you at the moment. Uh, so any of you, <laughs> Yuki, Andrea, yeah. Stacey, or Rumbi. Yeah. Uh, yes, I would, go first, please. No, no, Andres, please. I would go ahead. only add Ika. Ika asked for any suggestion for Indonesia, and I think we talked a lot about this um, interdependence of regulations and laws and so on. If you give money to political parties via public funding, ask them to really report their expenses and ask them to introduce intra-party democracy and transparency. Otherwise, no money. That would be a simple reform, and I think it could work quite well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Yuki, over um, to you. And also, I can't agree with uh, more with all the all the things said by all the participants panelists as well. But if if I were to mention uh, one key takeaway from this panel is just the implementation, implementation, implementation. Really, because um, I mean, except the case of Malaysia, but uh, in most countries, political finance laws are in place. And I don't think necessarily one law or, I mean, is better than the other. I mean, as long as certain regulations are there, I think in my opinion, it's better than none. But the problem is that um, laws are not really complied. Um, so that all goes back to some of the points we already raised in the panel that uh, capacity and the political independence and uh, and the legal mandate of uh, oversight agencies that really needs to be strengthened significantly in Southeast Asia if you want to see some uh, improvement uh, in the transparency and then uh, accountability in, in money in politics. I mean that's that's that because also I might just want to leave one interesting case is that overshooting the program, meaning you know, introducing laws after laws are not always uh, uh, effective either. I mean, if you consider, um, for example, the country like Sweden, where International Ideas Headquarters are uh, situated, is in fact, political finance is very loosely regulated. I mean, there's no many dedicated laws uh, to require political parties to act one way or the other. However, better or worse, I mean, at least perceived level of corruption or based on transparency's international corruption perception index, so to say, Nordic countries always appear to rank very highly uh, in the ranking as to uh, compare to the, you know, Southeast Asia countries. So it's not just about the introducing laws after laws, but it's more often about, you know, whether transparency is provided through either political party laws or access to information law or freedom of information act for example or or the oversight agencies have enough capacity to really uh, implement what they have already so the implementation is the key i think that's one uh, message that i like the audience to take away with from this panel 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yuki. I think a very relevant and apt uh, key message uh, that we should all take away with us. Um, anything anybody else would like to add, Daisy, if you have any other points you'd like to make before I close the panel for today? All right, so we are good, we are good. It was such a rich discussion. Uh, I am sure our audience has benefited from it as much as, as I have and I have absolutely enjoyed uh, moderating this session. Um, I just want to again remind our audience that the report that we are launching today uh, or have launched today can be accessed on uh, Preludem's website. The link has already been put in the chat box as well. In addition, Preludem has a number of relevant publications that could help you understand the political finance regime Regimes in Southeast Asia. They have a journal that they publish uh, semi-annually, uh, which can also be accessed on the website. Additionally, International IDEA has a host of uh, resources, including the political finance database, as well as numerous publications on the issue. So please log into the website uh, as well uh, to benefit from the rich resources uh, that have been produced by both these institutions. Um, on my behalf, I thank all the panelists and our participants for for their very active uh, engagement. Uh, and now I would like to hand the floor to uh, Theresia Joyce. Uh, she is the Chief of Party of Respect Program being led by Preludem. And with her remarks, we will close the session. Theresia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pastor. Honorable guests, distinguished speakers, Mr. Dipriko Hamada, Mr. Andrea Suvan, Mrs. Rumbitsai, Mrs. Desi Simanjunta, our moderator, Kusbu Agrawa, representative of USAID, and our partners organizations, thank you so much for your support in this international conference. Political party financing is notoriously difficult to monitor, and I really appreciate for the shared analysis and thoughts during this conference to understand and to examine the challenges of political party financing. Today is a part of significant stages of the process have been gone by, have been gone through by Lente, Bersih, Perludem, Pradet, Women Caucus, also the inter international idea to support the integrity of electoral and political processes. Today, Together with them, we want to emphasize once again about the importance to support every effort to strengthen and reform political party finance system. As Koyrinisa uh, mentioned in the opening, today is also a point of departure, meaning that tomorrow and for the next upcoming weeks, we will have four more conferences in the form of multi-stakeholders conferences hosted by Lente organizations from Philippines, Perludem from Indonesia, Pradet and Women Caucus from Timor-Leste, also Bersih from Malaysia. Its conference will discuss further about the research findings in its country and recent research recommendations, which we expect will be able to lead the adoption of significant standards for the setting up of transparent systems for political party financing. These four conferences also will mark the beginning of advocacy program in its respect targeted countries, which few of these countries will have their elections in the next coming years. I may uh, I may convey here that the whole program of political party finance supported uh, by uh, respect program is also a tribute to the political parties, individual politicians, scholars, democratic activists, and civil society in Southeast Asia region who understand the devastating effect of political corruption and who do their best to have a healthy democracy. Lastly, I will thank you again to Perludem and uh, the International Idea that have made this conference possible and confirm that party finance reform is well worth pursuing. Thank you. And I give the forum back to you, Kusbu. Thank you very much, uh, Theresia Joyce, for reminding all of us 
that we have to continue this conversation and this Recording conversation in progress. will continue uh, in the next four uh, sessions that will be uh, launching the regional or the country specific reports. Uh, thank you very much for your remark. Thank you everybody for joining in today. We appreciate you taking time and listening to the deliberations and thinking of this very important uh, issue of uh, political finance reform in the region. Uh, thank you again. Uh, have a very good day. Good evening. Good night. Uh, very well. <laughs> Bye. Recording stopped.